Welcome, friends. It's Bob and Fran, octogenarians and proponents of a healthy aging lifestyle. We have a special guest today. Dr. George Guthrie is a board-certified family medicine physician and a member of the academic program at Advent Health Center for Family Medicine in Winter Park, Florida, where he trains medical residents with a focus on community and lifestyle medicine. One of Dr. Guthrie's greatest joys is seeing his patients and community members embrace the principles of whole food, plant-based eating, and watching their health transformations. Welcome, Dr. Guthrie, and thank you for being here with us for your role in fostering lifestyle medicine. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. I think uh, I'll start out with some of the uh, questions. Uh, I think our, our viewers would like to know a little bit about your background, uh, your life, your education, uh, and your journey primarily to advocate for a whole food plant-based eating regimen. Can you talk a little bit about this? Sure, I'd be happy to. I, I graduated from medical school in 1981. And uh, I'd grown up the short, fat kid. So apparently I paid more attention in uh, biochemistry and got, I, I thought, quite a bit of nutritional information in medical school. I did my family medicine residency. And then after that, spent some time in uh, Guam, Micronesia. They call it Guam, United, uh, Guam USA. Uh, one of my patients there surprised me. He came in refusing all regular treatment for this newly diagnosed diabetes. And because of what I'd been learning, I asked him to please make some lifestyle changes and I wouldn't bother him with information about pills or insulin. And indeed, in a year's time, he had completely reversed his disease. Blood sugars were normal, blood pressure was normal. He'd lost 60 pounds and I had never seen it happen. It was amazing to me, it changed the perspective. Uh, from there, I went back several years later to do a master's of public health and nutrition, figuring I needed to expand my uh, knowledge base even further. So that was a, a good experience. I was able to teach at the uh, uh, graduate level uh, for a year until we moved to uh, Northern California, where my wife, who is a nurse practitioner, got very interested in uh, something called the CHIP program. You may have heard of it, where mm -hmm. people are making lifestyle changes. So, and it's done as a group. Well, I'd done a one on one to do it as a group. I discovered there's even more power there. So, that was a good experience seeing people's lives changed. From there, I had the opportunity to go to a place in Oklahoma called the Lifestyle Center of America, uh, kind of South Central Oklahoma, where people paid thousands of dollars to come and learn how to get rid of their diseases, get off their insulin, et cetera. So I spent about five years there. Most of that as the medical director. That was a joy uh, seeing those miracles happen one after the other. Yeah. And for the last 15 years, I've been here in uh, Florida uh, teaching the young doctors how to do similar things. Yeah. You know, it, it's, uh, it's funny because uh, Fran and I were talking uh, earlier to this morning that during our struggles with devastating life-threatening illnesses, Fran had myasthenia gravis, and I had renal cell carcinoma, all, both at the, about the same time in our lives. And Fran, especially, uh, I saw two or three doctors, and uh, Fran saw over 11 neurologists with her myasthenia. And all of these doctors that we, have, that we saw, never once did they ask anything about what we ate. It was always bring in your pill bottles and, and, and you know, the usual thing. And I'm wondering, is, is that starting to change? Well, one, one would hope so. The medical community tries to depend on science. And the... Uh, Science, uh, scientific process is a clumsy one that's very slow. And then there's the whole adoption business. So at the top of the uh, kind of evidence, the top of the, the strongest evidence is the randomized controlled trial. And that works great for drugs, but it just doesn't work very well for diet. You can't randomize somebody to uh, one particular 
food or pattern for their whole life, you have to use more epidemiologic studies, which are considered to be weaker and they're harder to, to uh, say cause and effect out of. And so I think doctors have been reticent. Uh, there is more information coming out. Uh, we're <laughs> looking for ways to improve that. There, I am one of the founding members of an organization, professional organization called the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. I was its uh, president for kind of a presidential cycle, and I'm pretty proud of uh, the group and what uh, we've been able to accomplish. So, yes, these things are getting out here within the last few weeks. We have uh, uh, published a couple of articles talking about uh, how to take people off of medications when you have <laughs> diabetes, for example. I mean, those are things that we just we don't uh, have, there's not much in the literature about those things. Ours is, as far as I know, the first article that actually addresses it. And it's a professional opinion sort of an article rather than a randomized controlled trial, but it's a part of that process. So mm -hmm. uh, forgive the uh, poor doctors who are unaware uh, or, and unwilling to uh, guess they want, it, they want it nailed down before they bother patients with these facts. Uh, I try to be patient with them, but... Uh, those I think that upset me most are the cardiologists. And I had a patient tell me this the other day. Uh, car, my cardiologist said there's nothing that diet can do for your heart. In 1991, <laughs> it was proved that you could actually reverse heart disease. Dean Ornish did that for us from University of California, San Francisco. So, yeah, I think there's some uh, ignorance that's chosen, if, if you will, because this is knowledge has been uh, well known. There's another piece that's important. Uh, and you're probably aware of this on an emotional level. A doctor that smokes can't, with, uh, with effectiveness, tell a patient to quit smoking. It just doesn't work very well. And until the doctor is actually living a healthy life, it's very hard for them to, uh, with integrity, to actually uh, uh, tell someone the right thing to do. So our own practices make a difference. Yeah. So... Uh uh, for our for our own edification and for uh, our viewers, what what about lifestyle medicine? What exactly is lifestyle medicine? And uh, I wonder if you could just speak to that and give us the, the, the basics about about that concept. Uh, it, it's a very uh, good question, and the word is used in a lot of different ways. The American College of Lifestyle Medicine has tried to uh, actually define it in a way that uh, it is better understood and become more uniform. It's now possible to be boarded in lifestyle medicine. So there is a board test for uh, health professionals to take. So that kind of helps to define it. But there are uh, different pillars of health, nutrition, exercise, uh, hydration, uh, sleep, stress management. I mean, the our lifestyle makes a difference in diseases, well, uh, especially the chronic diseases. When I was in residency, I was uh, taught that one should always look first for the non-drug therapy. Mm -hmm. So what's a non-drug therapy? If your disease is caused by lifestyle, and now we recognize that type 2 diabetes usually fits in this category, heart disease fits in this category, Many cancers fit in this uh, category. And likely, although we know less about it, autoimmune diseases also fit in this category. So the more one can do to change the lifestyle towards healthy, get rid of those things that are causing problems and embrace those things that are healing uh, of the whole lifestyle. It's not just nutrition. Uh, you know, the, the exercise, the sleep, even hydration, they, these things can make a huge uh, difference in people's uh, lives. Really exciting to see. Uh, those uh, changes happen in people when they start to make the right uh, lifestyle choices. So well, lifestyle medicine is focusing on the cause and uh, reversing the cause or getting the cause out of the way so that disease can begin healing. Well, could, could we say it's more of a holistic approach? Well, certainly it's more than pills. It involves our you know, social, our emotional even our spiritual health, along yeah. with the physical habits that we have. So, yes, uh, holistic, uh, as W-H-O-L-E, yeah. you know, whole has several ways of being uh, spelled. But uh, when it's holistic, you're looking at the whole person. It's exactly right. So in your book, and we'll talk about your book in a little bit, 
you, you, you title it, Eat Plants, Feel Whole. Feel Whole. This yes, what, that's you know, correct. Just happen to have one. Just happen to have one handy. So, well, well, well. And you have, I have one too. One huh? too. <laughs> so, so the the feel whole part. Uh, what are you getting at there? Is that I mean, to us being uh, plant based for sixteen years now, we do have this feeling of lightness and of uh, happiness uh, and confidence in our in what our diet is. Is that part of what you were getting at? Well, you know, we were just talking uh, about wholeness. I mean, you, you asked about holistic, which I suppose is very similar. Yeah. And yes, we're really talking about restoring that sense of health, happiness, uh, uh, meaning to life that brings us uh, pleasure. It's quality of life in many ways. So in lifestyle and medicine, is it, where does prevention come in? Uh, to me, <laughs> that's, to an, me that's so important. Uh, it's an interesting word. In medicine, we talk about uh, primary prevention, secondary prevention, tertiary prevention, and it may even go beyond, beyond that. So you're kind of thinking, I, I would say, what can we do to keep this from happening in the first place? And that would be primary prevention. Secondary prevention is... Uh, <laughs> You know, you've got the disease, but let's keep it from going further. So that would be like getting a colonoscopy and discovering a precancerous lesion. Okay, it started, but we're actually now going to prevent it from going further. And then tertiary prevention has to do with, uh, you know, the disease is already there. Let's see if we can actually uh, keep it from killing you. <laughs> so as I like to talk about a reversal or the more, uh, uh, I guess, uh, politically correct word now is remission of uh, these diseases. If they're caused by a lifestyle uh, and you, you change your lifestyle and it goes away, if you go back to your old lifestyle, the disease will come back. And so the word remission uh, yeah. fits very well in there. In your book, you give some wonderful success stories. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you share a couple with us? Well, just yesterday, I, I saw uh, one of my... Uh, Patients, one of the stories there in the book uh, back, he was, he told me, he says, yesterday, and of course, that would have been last Sunday, he said, is when I had my uh, procedure and discovered that my left main coronary artery was completely blocked. So, you know, his uh, diabetes has improved significantly, his uh, cholesterol has improved, and his certainly his function has improved on the plant-based diet, he's now training to do a triathlon. So oh, good. <laughs> we're very pleased with his progress, and he's a bundle of joy uh, every time he comes in just because of the lifestyle changes. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that's one of the stories in the book uh, that uh, I've got, I had a little bit of now more recent knowledge on just because I saw him yesterday. So. Great, great. One thing that, that I've noticed is the stories – of people reversing and preventing their illness with a, a whole food plant-based diet, they're not rare. There's lots of success stories, which people have to understand. Um, in your book, you talk about the four hidden culprits. What are they? You know, as I, you kindly sent me some questions ahead of time, and, <laughs> and I appreciate that. One of our focuses in... Uh, eat plants, feel whole, is to try not to talk so much about the bad, but talk about the good, yeah. okay? If someone is trying to quit smoking, I'll use that example again, and all they think about is quitting smoking and what's bad about it, they tend to get sucked right back into it because that's what they're thinking about. So our preference is, as we made up these uh, books, uh, was to try to make it positive so people are moving towards something good. So I turned your question around. I hope you'll forgive me for doing no, that. That's fine. And I said, what are the four things that are missing okay. <laughs> from most Americans' uh, diet? I, I assume that you wanted to kind of focus on that. So um, they're, number one, they're missing fiber. There's a big fiber deficit. Fiber does incredible things for the body. Not only does it make us feel full when we eat it sooner, since it has no calories, 
by definition, you put it in here and it comes out there, right? So <laughs> it's low calorie. And uh, so we're thankful for that. But when it gets, it slows the sugar going into the blood. So there's less insulin. Insulin is a growth hormone, which tends to make our weight go up. So if we can actually uh, slow that sugar in, we decrease that response. When it gets to the colon, the bacteria start to chew on it. You've probably heard of the microbiome. And the good bacteria like the microbiome. And uh, I'm sorry, the good bacteria like the fiber, soluble fiber especially. And when they break that fiber down, it makes something called propionate, which makes its way up to the brain and says, you're really not hungry, are you? So it helps to control appetite. What people are missing, they have no idea what they're missing with fiber. It is amazing what you can do with that. Uh, feed the good bacteria and your weight will tend to come down. The bad bacteria, which... Uh, are pushed out by good bacteria. The whole formiculae's class uh, it tends to make people gain weight. So anything we can do to kind of push it away is a very good thing, and fiber does that. So that's number one, fiber. Number two, I put down magnesium. Uh, 80% of uh, Americans, according to the uh, national, well, they call it NHANES, National what, uh, Health Examination Survey, uh, 80% of Americans over 65 are not getting the recommended daily allowance of magnesium. Magnesium calms down nerves, makes the heart less excitable, tends to help us sleep a little better. I just, this last couple of months, a paper came out demonstrating that if your calcium level, I'm sorry, your magnesium level is up in your blood, your, your cancer killing cells, the lymphocytes are much more effective. They can grab on those cancer cells and kill them better. We just don't know what we're missing by not getting enough magnesium. The third one I put down is potassium. Uh, we focus so much on sodium and trying to get it low. And I've seen patients who get their sodium so low that it starts to cause health problems. Low sodium can actually kill people. More important than lowering sodium, in my mind, is increasing potassium. So it's that sodium-potassium ratio that's the important one when it comes to hypertension, when it comes to... Uh, uh, diabetes and a bunch of different things. Uh, it, we're just we're often just missing the potassium. Where do you get potassium from? Foods. So which food is it that has the potassium in it? You all certainly have heard about potassium. So which food are you, are you asking us? Oh, yes, bananas. That's what everybody says. That's exactly right. But you know, beans have three times as much potassium as bananas do. It's for the same amount. It's about uh, around. The fourth thing that I put on my list here is water, hydration, just getting enough water. Uh, taking uh, 500 milliliters of water uh, a day in, and it doesn't work for fruit juice. It doesn't work for, for uh, you know, sodas. It doesn't work for dairy. Uh, the, the plain water was responsive uh, in one study, the Stanford uh, weight loss study, where they compared four diets. They went back and looked at, instead of the diet, the water. So five pounds a year uh, were related just to the water intake. So if we only knew what we could do with water, helping to decrease our appetite, decrease our caloric intake, increase our burn, when you have more water, you increase your metabolic rate. When your water goes low, your metabolism decreases. Much more than that, when your water is low, you increase inflammation in the blood vessels. And this tends to drive things like diabetes, heart disease, and cancer. So we don't like those things. We need to stay hydrated. There you got it. Fiber, magnesium, potassium, and water. Great. Perfect. Thank you. What, a, what a great lesson here. You know, we're like you and many others who are on a whole food plant-based diet, we're asked every day, where do we get our protein? But we're never asked, you know, where do we get our fiber? And yeah, uh, right. we're with you on, on the fiber thing. There's almost well, nothing that, that we eat that doesn't have a lot of fiber in it. Yeah, That's true. That's true. And, and I would, uh, you know, kind of like to add to that. People say, where do you get your protein? So the best place to get protein with about the same percentage of calories as beef or chicken or fish is beans. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, beans are the highest in potassium, as I've already pointed out. They're very high in magnesium. They're very high in fiber. 
And they're uh, an excellent source of protein without the problems that come from animal protein. So I like to say they're (laughs) inexpensive. We are human beings, okay? That's my way of kind of letting (laughs) patients know that uh, we need to be eating more beans. Yes. (laughs) Okay. So in in your opinion, what what is the best way for someone to start on a whole food plant-based lifestyle? Uh, would would you say gradually you can start uh, just uh, run you know run your pantry down of the bad stuff and just go to plants after that or would you say jump in a hundred percent or should you test it out for uh, uh, a month or two what 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 is the best way to to approach this for people that are thinking about it. Uh, we have addressed that in one of our books. You've got eat plants feel whole. We have the Eat Plants Feel Whole Journal, which is a way for people to track their lifestyle change positively. Instead of what they're missing, it's focusing on well, how can I get more points from something that's good. And if you fill your body up with fiber and magnesium and potassium and, and a plant protein, you're not going to have really the, the, the desire for it. So in that particular book, we address this whole issue in the first kind of part of the book. And we talk about uh, making change quickly versus making change more slowly. You can kind of ooze into health, or if you are really sick and you need to reverse this disease and make Mm -hmm. it go away, then you probably better jump in as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. So jumping in quickly is very good if it's an emergency. Jumping in slowly is uh, fine for everybody, and sometimes that's what a family needs. So... Let's talk about that jumping in slowly. Here's my recommendation. Most of us cycle around maybe 12 to 15 meals at, uh, over and over again, right? And uh, what my suggestion is, is that you find the meal that is the least healthy and then look for an alternative meal that's healthy. And there's all kinds of you know, different cultures with different meals. And find something you like and substitute it. And if everybody likes it, Take that one and put it in in place. The next month, do the next one. In a year and a half, you've got your whole kind of eating pattern changed, and it's not painful. It's fun. It's a journey. What can we find that's good? We that's good and healthy. So that's a very positive thing rather than a negative thing. Yeah, we personally we 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 love to eat, and when we come on to a, a new recipe or a new taste, it's like. Oh. It doesn't get any better. It's, it's, it's just, it is fun. Yeah. It, there's a lot, a lot of flavor within yeah. the plants, a lot more uh, different textures. So the plants are really much more diverse than animal products. It's just muscle, muscle, muscle from yeah. different animal each time, unless yeah. you're picking up organ meats. And those aren't all, uh, or those are some of the most unhealthy ones. So right. yes, at, they often... <laughs> put flavors into the meat by yeah. using plants. So <laughs> focus on that. the plants. Yeah. What is your position on fasting and body detoxification? Well, if you talk about detoxification, I start to get nervous because when somebody says colonics, I run about as fast as I can. <laughs> okay. The best way uh, to clean out your colon is to actually put a bunch of fiber down. I think of it as little brushes going down through the colon, cleaning out the bad stuff and uh, and supplying new stuff. So uh, fiber is a good way to go. Uh, Legumes are great for that. Now, as far as fasting is concerned, fasting is really uh, amazing. The intermittent fasting or time limited feeding. There's a lot of excitement about that in the lay and scientific press. Certainly, it's one of the few things that we have demonstrated in the scientific literature to reverse fatty liver. Fatty liver and fatty pancreas are uh, kind of a hallmark, the, the, one of the things that happens in type 2 diabetes as well as, you know, some other diseases as well. And to get that to reverse, uh, some sort of fasting is going to be extremely beneficial. Good. Is it true that you only eat two meals a day? Well, uh, that's true. I mean, sometimes... If my lunch is very small, I'll have a little something in the evening. But usually it's breakfast and lunch. That's correct. 
<laughs> right. So the idea is that you're extending the hours between meals as, as much as possible. Well, it's that uh, time where there's no eating. It takes about 8 to 12 hours to reach the true fasting state. You know, fasting means different things to different people. Sometimes it's a religious thing. Sometimes it's a health thing. Sometimes it means uh, th that sounds uncomfortable. I'm hungry, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, from a physiologic standpoint, fasting means energy is coming from storage rather than from the intestines. So mm -hmm. in essence, that's what it means. It takes about 8 to 12 hours to reach that state. Once you reach that state, the body is going into a, kind of a protective mode. And that protective mode helps to... Uh, reverse these diseases, reverse the disease processes. Uh, and interestingly, with the refeeding, there's a stimulation of the rebuild. There's a, a new kind of fasting, at least relatively new, called fasting mimicking diet, where it's five days with uh, uh, only putting foods in that do not uh, destroy <laughs> the uh, fasting state physiologically. So you're still eating something, but it's and it, they only use plants uh, and they're focusing most on uh, plant fats and not so much the carbohydrates, although there's a little bit. So five days of that with very low calories and with the rebound, you increase muscle cells, you increase pancreatic cells in the mouse. They were able to completely rebuild a dead pancreas in five cycles. It's done once a month. Increase, uh, did I say brain cells? Yes. And uh, muscle cells. So uh, people who, their body goes in and starts to pull back on the muscle, but when they start to refeed, the muscles will be even bigger than before. So it's very amazing. Decreasing inflammation, helping to fight cancer. I mean, it's um, absolutely amazing what fasting does. This uh, kind of fasting mimicking diet has been uh, uh, a powerful new tool that I don't have a lot of experience yet with, but we're uh, yeah. patients who would like to do it. I'm trying to help them. Well, we, we, we really are buying into uh, this whole idea of uh, lifestyle medicine. I mean, these are things that you're talking about today. I don't think they're really that discussed in term in, in mainstream medicine. So what, what do you see as the future for, for lifestyle medicine? I mean, how do you, in, what is your vision here? We would like to see, uh, and I say we because I feel very much part of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. So if you look at our vision, by the way, uh, membership is getting very close to 10,000 physicians across the country. So that's uh, very encouraging from our humble start around 2007. So it's growing. Having a board that lays out the science and keeps up to date with the science and asks questions about the science in order to get boarded helps to stabilize exactly what we're doing. We would like to see non-drug therapy, the standard across all primary care, no matter which disease somebody comes in. We think all physicians need to know what the basic lifestyle issues are and be able to tell their patients about them. Now, so not all patients will do what you tell them to do, okay? So there's a, a significant responsibility that uh, lies on the patient. So we, ex we think that's what should happen at the primary care level. But there's also need for intensive lifestyle interventions. And that is specialists who know how to help people who are really sick use the lifestyle to reverse or put their disease into remission. So we think we see a space, a place for specialists, but we also see a very important place for the primary care community as well. Several people who are, um, you know, that see us on YouTube have asked us, how can they find a lifestyle doctor in the area where they live? Because they don't know of any. So what's the best way to find a lifestyle doctor? Well, I would go to the uh, website of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine and look for those who are, who are members. Now, I can't vouch for everybody's uh, skill level, but if you want to find somebody, that sounds like a really good place to start. Okay, good. That's, we'll a, that's, that. that's a good idea. So uh, maybe one last question for you. Uh, tell us about plant-wise uh, I happen to go to the PlantWise website, and I'm going to have a. Uh, I'll have links in the description section to uh, to PlantWise. But 
Uh, is this is a project, uh, I think, through Advent Health System. And uh, I watch their, their, their film. I see what resources they, they uh, are uh, that they uh, offer for free. Uh, so what is your connection there and what's, what's, what's going on with that? Well, as, as uh, I've told you, I'm interested in lifestyle medicine. I've been here at Advent Health in Orlando area for about 15 years. And my dream was to bring uh, lifestyle medicine to the medical community. Most of the uh, kind of plant-based nutrition, kind of promoting healthy lifestyle films, I think it would be safe to say almost all of them that I've seen have put down on doctors. And if we're going to talk to, if we're going to be telling stories in the medical system, we need a film, we needed a film, we need a film that does not put down on doctors. That's going to be an immediate turnoff. And so uh, that was kind of the nitus of this, uh, w- along with a dream of mine. We had uh, uh, we've had grants from the Advent Health, we had, had uh, grants from the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, and from Ardmore Institute of Health. Uh, three of them, uh, kind of together, to help us kind of develop this program. And this is what happens with it in our hospital. Uh, when someone is admitted to our Winter Park Hospital. Uh, if they have diabetes of the appropriate code, the diabetes order set is used by the doctor to make orders for the patient. In that order set, the doctor can opt out if they want. There is a order for the nurse to give the patient an advertisement card for a uh, plant-wise film. Encourage them then to watch it, and hopefully they will go home and uh, a- watch it hopefully increase their uh, interest in in making changes. I am at present uh, preparing the grant uh, report for the end of the grant. And uh, we're just going over the statistics over this last week. And it looks like there's a significant, well, there's, it's effective in helping people move from, uh, from, uh, well, I've, you know, maybe I've thought about it too. I'm ready to go now. So it, it helps move people towards, Will it being willing to make changes. Mm-hmm. So we're thankful for that. Unfortunately, we started it at the same time COVID came in. And so what that means is that um, the um, people who come to the hospital have been more worried about COVID than they have been about their diabetes. So our uptake mm-hmm. has been very low, about 1% engagement, which, you know, we're sad about. But for those people who we have the biometric data on, we can say they tend to lose weight, their A1Cs tend to come down, their cholesterol tends to improve, and they are more likely to change. And of course, you've pointed out we have those uh, resources on there, hopefully to help people make those changes. Yeah, we, we would encourage all of our viewers to, uh, to uh, go into the description section below and check the link for uh, PlantWise and uh, and watch that film and take advantage of the resources. It's all free and it's very, very good stuff. Big screen is really nicer than your phone, although you can see it on your phone. Yeah. <laughs> no, the big screen is a little yeah. better. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Dr. Guthrie, for your time and your insights. And to our viewers, we look forward to your comments and, of course, appreciate your subscribing and joining us on this healthy life journey. And we look forward to seeing you again very soon. Bye for now. now.